should not greatly err in our summary of this sublime psalm if we call it the psalm of Messiah the Prince, for it sets forth as a wondrous vision the tumult of the people against the Lord's anointed, the determined purpose of God to exalt his own son and the ultimate reign of that son over all his enemies. Let us, let us read it with the eyes of faith, beholding as in a glass the final triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ over all his enemies. We have in the first three verses a description of the hatred of human nature against the Christ of God. No better comment is needed upon it than the apostolic song in Acts chapter 4 verse 27 to 28. For of a truth against your holy child Jesus whom you have anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done. Verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a faint thing? The psalm begins abruptly with an angry interrogation. And well it may, it is surely but a little to be wondered at that the sight of the creatures in arms against their God should amaze the psalmist's mind. A vain thing. In Spain two monumental pillars were raised in which were written one. The Ecclesian, Jovian, Maximinium, Herculeus, Caesarus, Augusti, for having extended the Roman Empire in the East and the West and for having extinguished the name of Christians who brought the Republic to ruin. Two. Diocletian, Jovian, Maximum, Herculeus, Caesarus, Augusti, for having adopted Galerius in the East, for having everywhere abolished the superstition of Christ, for having extended the worship of the gods. We have here a monument raised by paganism over the grave of its vanquished foe, but in this the people imagine a vain thing. Neither in Spain nor elsewhere can be pointed out the burial place of Christianity. It is not for the living have no tomb. Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves. In determined malice, they arrayed themselves in opposition against God. It was not temporary rage, but deep-seated hate. For they set themselves resolutely to withstand the Prince of Peace. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. They go about their warfare craftily, not with foolish haste, but deliberately. They used all the skill art they gave. Like Pharaoh, they cry, Let us deal wisely with them. Oh, that men were half as careful as God's servants to serve him wisely as his enemies were to attack his kingdom craftily. Sinners have their wits about them, and yet saints are dull. Why do they band themselves against the Lord and against his anointed? What would they have? His blood? Yes. They took counsel, says Matthew. To put him to death. They had the devil's mind which is not satisfied but with death. And how did they contrive it? They say they took counsel about it. Verse 3. Let us break their bands asunder. Let us be free to commit all manner of abominations. Let us be our own gods. Let us rid ourselves of all restraint. Let us cast away their cords from us. There are monarchs who have given, who have spoken thus and they are still rebels upon thrones. However mad the resolution to revolt from God, it is one in which man has preserved ever since his creation, and he continues in it to this very day. The glorious reign of Jesus is the latter day will not be consummated until the terrible struggle that convulsed the nations. To a graceless neck the yoke of Christ is intolerable, but to the saved sinner it is easy and light. We may judge ourselves by this. Do we love that yoke, or do we wish to cast it from us? Verse 4. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. According to our capacities, the prophet desires God, as ourselves would be in a merry disposition, deriding vain attempts. He laughs, but it is in scorn. He scorns, but it is with vengeance. He permitted his temple to be sacked and rifled, the holy vessels to be profaned and Groused in, but did not God's smile make Balthazar to tremble at the handwriting, handwriting on the wall? Oh, what are his frowns of his smiles so terrible? He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. This tautology or repetition of the same thing is a sign of the thing being established. According to the authority of the patriarch Joseph, for having interpreted the dream of Pharaoh, he said, and for that dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Therefore, here also shall laugh, 
and shall have them in derision. It is repetition to show that there is not a doubt to be entertained that all these things will most surely come to pass. Verse 5 Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. After he has laughed, he shall speak. He needs not smite the breath of his lips is enough. Vex them, either by horror of conscience or corporal plagues. One way or the other, he will have his pennies worth of them. And he always has had of the persecutors of his people. Verses 5 and 9. It is easy for God to destroy his foes. Now, thirty Roman emperors, governors of provinces, and other high in office, who distinguished themselves by their zeal and bitterness in persecuting the early Christians, one became speedily deranged after some atrocities cruelty. One was slain by his own son, one became blind, the eyes of one started out of his head, one was drowned, one was strangled, one died in a miserable captivity, one fell dead in a manner that would not bear recital, one died of so loathsome a disease that several of his physicians were put to death because they could not abide the stench that filled his room. Two committed suicide, a third attempted it, but had to call for help to finish the work. Five were assassinated by their own people or servants. Five others died the most miserable and excruciating death, several of them having an untold complication of diseases, and eight were killed in battle or after being taken prisoners. Among these was Julian the Apostate. In the days of his prosperity, he is said to have pointed his dagger to heaven, defying the Son of God, whom he commonly called the Galilean. But when he was wounded in battle, he saw that all was over with him, and he gathered up his clotted blood and threw it into the air, exclaiming, Thou hast conquered, O thou Galilean. Verse 6 Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Despite your malice, despite your tumultuous gatherings, despite the wisdom of your counsels, and despite the craft of your lawgivers, he has already done that which the enemy seeks to prevent. While they are proposing, he also disposed the matter. Jehovah's will is done, a man's will frets and raves in vain. Christ is a king above all kings. What are they, the mighty men, the great, the honourable men of the earth to Jesus Christ? They are but a little bubble in the water. For if all the nations in comparison with God be but a drop of the bucket, or the dust of the balance, as the prophet speaks in Isaiah 40 verse 15, how little then must be the kings of the earth. Verse 7 I will declare and decree. Looking into the angry face of the rebellious kings, the united one seems to say, If this suffice not to make you silent, I will declare the decree. Now this decree is directed in conflict with the device of man. First tenor is the establishment of the very dominion against which the nations are raving. You are my son. Here is a noble proof of the glorious divinity of our Emmanuel. This day I have begotten you. This refers to the Godhead of our Lord. Let us not attempt to fathom it, for it is a great truth, a truth reverently to be received, but not irreverently to be scanned. In attempting to define the Trinity or unveil the essence of divinity, many men have lost themselves. Your great ships have floundered. What have we to do in such a sea with our frail skiffs? This, the dispute concerning the eternal filiation of our Lord betrays more of the presumptuous curiosity than of the reverent faith. It is an attempt to explain where it is far better to adore. We can give rival expositions of this verse, but we forbear. The controversy is one of the most unprofitable which ever engaged the pens of theologians. Verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Those who did not bend must break. Potter's vessels are not to be restored if dashed in pieces, and the ruin of sinners will be hopeless if Jesus shall smite them. Verse 10. Be wise. Oh, how wise, how infinitely wise is obedience to Jesus, and how dreadful is the folly of those who continue to be his enemies. Verse 11. Rejoice with trembling. Fear without joy is torment, and joy without holy fear would be presumption. Verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. Judas betrayed his master by a kiss, and yet God commands this and expresses his love in this. Everything that has or may be abused 
was not therefore be abandoned, and the turning of a thing out of the way is not taking of that thing away, but good things deflected to ill use by some, may be by others reduced to their first goodness. Then let us consider the, and magnify the goodness of God that has brought us into this distance, that we may kiss the Son, that the expressing of his love lies in our hands. God, who is love, can be angry, and then, that is, that this God, who is angry, here, is the Son of God. He that has done so much for us, and therefore in justice may be angry. He that is our judge, and therefore in reason, we are to fear his anger. And then, in a third branch, we shall see how easily his anger departs, a kiss removes it. If you be despised for loving Christ in his gospel, remember that when David was taught base for dancing before the ark, his way was to be more base. The more you trouble yourself or are troubled by others for Christ, the more peace you have in Christ. To make peace with the Father, kiss the Son. Let him kiss me, was the church's prayer. Let us kiss him, that be our endeavour. Indeed, the Son must first kiss us by his mercy before we shall kiss him by our pity. Lord, grant in these mutual kisses and interchangeable embraces, now that we may come to the plenary wedding supper hereafter, when the choir of heaven, even the voices of angels, shall sing nuptial songs at the bridal of the spouse of the Lamb. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. It is an awful thing to perish in the midst of sin, in the very way of rebellion, and yet how easily could his wrath destroy us suddenly. It needs not that his anger should be heated seven times hotter. Let the fuel kindle but a little, and we are consumed. O sinner, take heed of the terrors of the Lord, for our God is a consuming fire. Unspeakable must the wrath of God be when it is kindled fully, since perdition may come upon the kindling of it but a little. In the first psalm we saw the wicked driven away like chaff. In the second psalm we see them broken in pieces like a potter's vessel. In the first psalm we, be, he, we beheld the righteous like a tree planted in the rivers of water. And here we contemplate Christ, the covenant head of the righteous, made better than a tree planted by the rivers of water. For he has made kings of all the islands, and all the heathen bow before him and kiss the dust while he himself gives a blessing to all those who put their trust in him.